Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Deconstructing Ransomware to Protect Small and Medium Businesses. Before I turn this over to our speaker, Ananth, let me run through a few housekeeping items for you. If you have any questions, please enter them in the questions tab on the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to get to as many of those as possible at the end of today's webcast. Also, if you're looking for the recording, we will be getting this out within the next couple of days, hopefully tomorrow, but if not, definitely early next week. Um, we'll be include that in our post webcast email. So be on the lookout for that recording and your ability to share it with uh, other people in your company. Also, we do have a poll during today's webcast, so we do invite you to participate in that. And finally, you will have a chance. Uh, we'll give you some information about some event tracker live demos that we do and your ability to register. We'll also have those in the post webcast emails. So those are definitely some things to look forward to. That's all the housekeeping items I have for today. So now I'm going to turn it to our Chief Strategy Officer and CEO of Event Tracker, Ananth, as a variety and years of expertise in this industry. So Ananth, on to you, sir. Thank you, David. Good day, everybody. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, in these uncertain times, uh, there is nothing perhaps so certain as malware. Uh, and so even though we're all struggling with a very unusual topsy-turvy universe, uh, the scourge of the 21st century, that is malware on, on IT networks, appears to be un, un, unfortunately unaffected uh, by all of this. Just a little bit of background on why we're qualified to even speak about such a subject. Um, Event Tracker is a, is a managed security solution and we've been offering it as a service for about four years now as a product for maybe about a dozen. And our SOC, or our SOCs, I should say plural, um, see about 2 billion events a day, every day. We have uh, some 80-odd analysts in our two SOCs, and we've become certified ISO 27001. So we see a lot of this stuff day in and day out across a variety of firms uh, across the world. And it's on the basis of that experience that we're trying to tell you, what is this thing called ransomware? Um, how is it? How has it happened in the in the last uh, 12 months? What are some trends that uh, you can maybe think about because they will no doubt affect you. By the way, our primary focus is on medium-sized businesses and smaller networks. Um, these typically haven't been the attack or the target of these attacks, but that has changed simply because the attackers find that these are less well defended. They find that they are happy hunting ground, if you will and they can give them the kind of lifestyle that they're looking for. So that's why this has become a big deal in the small and medium enterprise. Whereas, you know, years past, you used to get these advanced persistent threats and they really went after the biggest of big fish. But now they are, uh, they are a target. Um, there are some challenges that we will go through in detecting ransomware. It isn't as easy as it might appear uh, or as we'll make it appear in the demos because we will sort of... Uh, uh, lay everything bare, but uh, the attackers do a good job of trying to hide within the within the the standard pattern. We'll take a look at that. We will actually look at a, a an attack. This happened uh, earlier this year against uh, against a customer. Uh, of course, uh, no details provided as to the nature of that customer, but rather focusing on how these things do happen and. Uh, what can you do from a recommendation perspective to to kind of get ahead of the curve? This is what the focus of today's today's webinar is. So first and foremost, um, why are small medium businesses, and I'm specifically talking about those in North America, you know, it's the really certain problem. It's where the money is. When he was caught and asked, why did you rob a bank? He was like, duh, well, that's where the money is. SMBs are being targeted because they are easy pickings and they have a willingness to pay. So there are two things about SMBs. One is that they tend to be vulnerable. You know, why are they vulnerable? Well, a couple of reasons is one is that the, their security uh, infrastructure uh, is limited, both in terms of people, this kind of specialist staff, as, a, as well as in terms of money, how much you've deployed by way of technology. Um, second, practice. It is unfortunately the case that patching, which is a 
religion almost and you must take very seriously is likely to not have occurred to the to the last endpoint to the last application this is a this is typical of smbs that um, that that are looking at it as as a necessity rather than as a reason to live um, the second reason of course is attackers find that that smbs are more likely to pay ransom if you looked at the trend in 2019 the median payment was around twelve and a half thousand dollars. Um, they look for between fifteen hundred to fifteen thousand paid paid in Bitcoin. They want to make it big enough that it's worth their while, but yet not so big that you will simply balk and say, "No, I'm not going to pay that." And so, small businesses that that maybe you know do uh, several million a year will find a forty or a fifty thousand dollar payment to be a painful thing but not something that they will unreasonably say, no, I'm never gonna do that, I'd rather go out of business. So this is why these folks are out there targeting. Uh, by the way, uh, if you look back at 2019, uh, the average ransomware lasted for around 15 days, meaning that for 15 days, the, the person that was attacked struggled to not pay the ransom, You know, tried their best to recover and try, to the extent that they actually paid, took them 15 days to pay. When they paid, around 90% of them did get a decryptor tool that kind of sort of worked. The bad news is that once you pay, you get tagged as a mark. And once you're a mark, then they will come at you again and again. And there's no guarantee that the attacker has in fact decrypted everything. So it's likely that you're gonna get attacked again, which is why of course the FBI says you don't wanna pay. You really only wanna pay as an absolute last resort if it looks like that is between you and shutting down the business and you look at the ransom and you decide, yeah, it's painful, but I can stomach it. But otherwise, by and large, not a good good deal. So they're you know, pursuing law firms, uh, they're pursuing accounting firms, public sector schools, you might have heard the, the stories, uh, local governments. Nowadays with COVID-19 and the budget being where they are, those are maybe less interesting, but they're also pursuing MSPs. Um, and, and they're hoping that a painful payment for you is not the end of the business and you, you are, uh, willing to pay if push comes to shove. From the attacker's perspective, this is nice work if you can get it. What do I mean by that? Well, attackers generated 1.5 trillion in 2019. You know, your typical ransomware will generate roughly around 20 to 30,000 per victim. And so if you can do that several times a day, why then you've got a solid business. Um, they also have an attractive lifestyle. Nobody is telling them when to show up. They're their own boss. They pretty much work from home, something that we've experienced for the last month. They've been doing forever, working in their pajamas. There's a tiny, teeny chance of being caught. You know, if you compare this to burglary, um, the average burglary is for something like $2,500. And today in the United States, there are some 7 million people in jail, probation, parole, etc. On the other hand, if you look at convictions for cybercrime back in 2018-19, there were a total of six by the FBI for cybercrime. There's a one in four chance that for a $2,500 burglary, you're gonna get caught. And oh, by the way, it's a ton of work. You gotta get up, you gotta wear that mask, you gotta get out in the middle of the night, you gotta carry that sack. You have to you know, break into somebody's house, you gotta do physical work. Whereas, you know, the cybercrime guy sitting at home in his pajamas, and launching spam emails. So this is why it's it's valuable for the attackers. Um, it's become specialized to the extent now that you have ransomware available to you as a service. There are specialists uh, and different parts of the, of the ransomware uh, kill chain are done by different specialists. Someone to do the penetration and then auction it off, someone else to do the exfiltration or the actual ransoming themselves and they will actually rent time on, on systems. So um, it's become a service, and for a relatively small fee, you can get pretty good ransomware kits that are up to date. So there are people actually selling this in the dark web um, as a technology for attackers to use. They don't themselves don't have to actually develop it. They can buy it from someone that's specialized in this stuff. So as uh, Corleone said, it's not personal, it's business. And for our friends over there in the attacker family, they don't know you, they don't care about you, they're just doing this as a business. So, th so they do it at scale, you know, go send out a million events today, a million emails today, hoping that, you know, maybe 100,000 of those, someone will actually double click the attachment, hoping that in 10,000 of those, maybe that'll get past the antivirus, 
hoping that in a thousand of those it will actually work out and out of and the ransom note get thrown up and that maybe 10 of those will actually pay if you can get 50k 10 times a day and you can do that seven days a week well you got some real money there so what makes this so difficult uh, to catch i mean after all if this is such a big deal you figure everyone and their brother is out trying to catch this stuff so there are some challenges in detecting ransomware that you've got to be mindful of. First of all, um, these days, they're really using legitimate tools. This is called living off the land, L-O-T-L. Uh, and rather than deploy some piece of malware that from the outside, at some stage, they will use tools that are already built into your environment. A classic example of that, of course, is PowerShell. Um, this is built into Microsoft Windows and is used for legitimate purposes all the time. And so if they can abuse that, and you'll see it in our demo, then they don't have to introduce anything new into your into your network. Um, the other thing they will do is try their best to co-opt insider accounts. I mean, if, if, if uh, the account Bob is known to you, is a member of your network, and uh, does things, then you're less likely to pay attention to what, what Bob's doing. Of course, if Bob is doing bizarre, strange things, it may or may not come to your attention. In the city of Baltimore, as a for instance, uh, somewhere near our, our headquarters, um, they, they co-opted the account of a domain admin. When the investigation happened and they confronted the admin and said, you've been doing all of these things in the months preceding the, the final burn down of the house, he was flabbergasted. Because of course he hadn't done any of those things um, and no one was paying attention because that was a legitimate account you know used legitimately for domain administration purposes yet another technique or a problem that ransomware has is that you've deployed endpoint protection epp your antivirus as an example so they've gone fileless and when they've gone fileless this tends to leave the antivirus sort of helpless not sure exactly what is it that they have to do they will abuse service accounts. These are accounts that are used um, typically in the organization to perform patching, to perform other administrative stuff. They tend to be non-interactive, meaning no human is supposed to log in, but it's used by the script. Very often, they don't have two-factor authentication enabled. You hear again and again, or oh, you can defeat it, turn on 2FA. Well, yeah, except how do you turn on 2FA if it's a service account? That becomes a lot harder to do. So sometimes these things don't have two-factor enabled. And then usually they have access to every endpoint everywhere because you're trying to patch everything. So if they can abuse a service account, and we see this on a regular basis, something that is actually used for patching, right, which is a legitimate activity that you do, uh, then they can have unrestricted access inside the network. Ransomware also tends to leverage the typical network design. And what does what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is there's a lot of uh, restriction and, and inspection on what's called north-south traffic. That is from your network to the internet and back again. That's north-south. But on the other hand, east-west traffic from one workstation in your environment to another, from, from it to a domain controller inside the network, there's a lot less uh, restriction, a lot less inspection. So lateral movement, as it's called, becomes a lot easier because ain't nobody looking at east-west traffic. Um, also, very often, the network design is worried about from the internet to the network. But from the network to the internet is usually wide open. And if it is, uh, why then they will take advantage of that too? Why? It's because your, your employees are, are so-called trusted. And why would they be doing anything that would be inimical to the enterprise? Well, it's not them. Their account's been co-opted, remember? So this is a typical network design which is leveraged by the, the ransomware folk. And what all of this does is it sort of defeats uh, uh, network monitoring. In 2019, it was more common that ransomware didn't do any exfiltration. So there wasn't a lot of traffic going out from your network uh, out to the out to the ransomware provider and so if you were looking for traffic pattern hoping that if someone is sending out large amounts of data to china that's a problem well they never sent large amounts of data to china recently in 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 the in the march april time frame of this year they have modified their technique and some some of the uh, attackers uh, sodino kibi comes to mind reval comes to mind are in fact 
uh, extracting uh, data as well. And when you when you choose not to pay, why then they're releasing that data out on on pace.bin. We saw some examples in the press recently, even as late as yesterday, where this kind of tactic has become common. But they are trying their best to defeat network monitoring. So these are some challenges with detecting ransomware. Let's let's go to a poll. Here's the polling question for you. So the question is, uh, what is it that concerns you the most about ransomware? I mean, surely you've come to this uh, to this webinar, and this is a topic of interest to you. So here are four choices. Is it that you worry about uh, there's an expense to detect and mitigate this? Uh, that's the cost of dealing with it. You'll have to hire somebody probably. You'll have to go to backup, you know, recover the, the backups, restore them. You'll have to suffer with outage for a period of time. Is that what, what bothers you about it? Or is it that you don't want to pay the ransom, um, whether they're asking for 50000 or 15000 or 500000 Is the cost of the ransom a problem? Are you concerned about the risk to brand reputation? Perhaps that if the word gets out, uh, we've certainly seen this from a lot of our, of our customers and from the public at large, because the resulting bad publicity is heinous to sort of deal with. Or is it that you're in a regulated industry and there's going to be a penalty for you because of a fine, because of uh, some, some compliance mandate? So if you could decide which of these bothers you the most, that would be, uh, that would be great. So how are we doing, David, on the... On the poll, uh, we're doing all right. We have about half the people have voted, so if everybody wants to get their uh, get their votes in, um, we'll be closing it here in just about ten more seconds. So give everybody one last one last chance. There, some people are picking up and starting to vote, so um, we will close that out, and then I'll get the results up for you here. Um, last chance, three, two, and one. All right, the poll is now closed. All right, and I'm going to share the results here with you, Anand. There you can see that the cost to detect and mitigate um, won the poll, 36%. Um, the cost of the ransom itself, uh, 29%. And then third place, implications on compliance mandates and fines. And following it up, and this actually didn't get some votes until very end there, risk to brand, reputation, and bad publicity. So um, those are the results of the poll. Thank you. Thank you for responding, guys. Uh, that's helpful. So in fact, you are correct. Um, if, you, if you look at the costs of actually mitigating this, uh, they can actually add up, you know, above and beyond whatever the fine may be. And of course, you try your best uh, to take care of this, um, uh, you know, inside the family, as it were. Uh, but it, it it there is a cost when your when your uh, systems are not operational when you have to recover from uh, backup these are not not easy things to do um, and so it would be a really good thing if you were able to actually avoid it uh, here's an example for you uh, from our case files we published this on our website we call them catch of the day uh, this happened at a healthcare organization uh, up in the northeast it was actually winter and the bad guys sent out, a, there was an impending snowstorm, the weather service had issued a, an advisory, and these guys cloaked their spam phishing email saying that here's our snow policy. Getting a employee to actually double click on it even though it obviously wasn't from HR. Um, and then they, they uh, you know, kind of spread internally. We were able to save the day in this instance because uh, not only did they have our service, but they also had our EDR solution. Uh, and we were able to uh, detect it sufficiently in advance. So this is an example for you. There's plenty more catch of the day available to you at our website if you're so inclined. Uh, these are stories of what, how these things actually unfold, and of course they're anonymous, uh, but they're illustrative of the problems that, that uh, we're talking about. A common way of describing this is something called a kill chain. Uh, this, is a, this is a phrase popularized by Lockheed Martin. Um, and there are stages, as you can see, uh, from recon uh, to weaponization and ultimately command and control installation. And these are the stages that an infection goes through. I mean, it's nice to think to yourself, and there are certainly some, 
where all of these stages happen in a matter of minutes. But more frequently, these stages might take a day, a day and a half, sometimes a week. There are cases, if especially if it is not automated, where the attacker is very patient. In the city of Baltimore example that I cited, um, it was thought that the initial stage happened in February and the attacker had free reign of the house till around June before they panicked and rushed away. So it's not, we're not talking about a couple of days here. Um, so recon, right? A popular method of recon in the first three months of the year has been, I'll say pre-RSA. The RSA show happened toward the end of February, but for the first two months and the th fourth quarter of last year, uh, phishing topics were very popular. Um, these days, COVID-19 cure is the is the topic of the email, trying to get you to to you know to to double click on the attachment. In the since RSA uh, or maybe a week or two before that, uh, for the last couple of months, RDP access has become a big deal. Why so? Well, we've all shifted to working from home, and so remote access has become even more necessary. Uh, equipment is still there back at the office. It's still turned on. It's still doing its thing, but we're seeing, rant, you know, coin uh, uh, generation, uh, Bitcoin generation, and second, we're seeing is that remote access is much more, much more available. Microsoft, in fact, put out an advisory yesterday or the day before, uh, specifically warning about insecure remote access. But that's the that's the recon step in the kill chain. Uh, the weaponization also happens by delivering that uh, that email now that they know who to send it to. Maybe they worked out in the recon that your pattern was first initial last name at company.com, uh, but either an infected USB or a phishing campaign is how the, the weaponization uh, occurs. Um, for delivery, if it is phishing, why then they're often getting by uh, an anti-spam that might be at the mail server. In In some cases, uh, you still have maybe that exchange implementation on premise. You've been thinking about getting rid of it, but that's in the plan and it hasn't happened yet. And for some reason it isn't, uh, you know, fully, uh, fully patched up or it is vulnerable. We've seen cases where Citrix have, uh, you know, a vulnerability. There are some, some SharePoint vulnerabilities that might not have been patched. Um, Zoho's manage engine was a victim at some point. So there are a variety of public facing servers that might be inside your on your premise or inside your 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 footprint your your infrastructure that could in fact be vulnerable and so they will try to spoof a user a trusted user get by the anti spam and then they get to the exploitation stage right endpoint protection somehow gets defeated maybe it's fileless and the antivirus couldn't really do a thing uh, maybe it's a zero day attack and the signature hasn't happened yet. These are common techniques. It can be mutating and polymorphic, meaning that there isn't a signature. Every time it runs, it generates a new signature. We've seen this often enough, which means that the signature based mechanism really was doomed from the start, had no hope. Also, inside to outside traffic is wide open. In the demo, you'll see that um, the, the in the example we're showing for, for a fake company called FirmTech, that they're allowing access to Microsoft.com. So the attacker happily downloads a tool called PSExec uh, from Microsoft.com and then uses that to, to joyride around the network. Um, installation. So having downloaded it, they may crack passwords, scan the local network, copy targets to the ransomware. Frequent tactic is to use a shared drive, right? If you have shares inside your network, again, think east-west traffic, not really being uh, scrutinized. And so then you'll see existing solutions like BITS, the background intelligence transfer service, which is built into Microsoft, um, or you'll see PS Exec, which I mentioned before, which is a tool meant for this kind of remote deployment, actually being used, right? All too frequently last year, there wasn't any command and control in the sense that the, the malware wasn't phoning home for instruction. It was relatively self-sufficient. Once it managed to get a toehold in, it knew what to do. It could run down four or five or six different paths. And if any of those paths succeeded, why then it was done? There was no command and control. It threw up the ransom note, and then you would either pay or you wouldn't. If you didn't, fine. He's never going to call you. He doesn't know how to call you. If you did pay, you're the one calling. They're not the one calling you.
So they give you instructions on where to send the money, and either you will or you won't. Either way, they don't care. They've moved on to the next soft target. So this is the this is the pattern that you see. So for those of you that um, are aware of MITRE ATT&CK, um, uh, if you are not, then this is something to be mindful of. The, the MITRE Corporation is a nonprofit funded by the US government They're here in Virginia, and they have developed an encyclopedia of attack techniques. This is a very useful thing for blue team folks like us. Uh, blue team, by the way, defends, red team attacks. So for blue team folks, um, they have described in standard language what are many of the attacks that, that are occurring? And they have a standard nomenclature. We support the attack framework, and in fact, incorporated in Event Tracker 9.3. And this gives you some clues on suspicious activity. It overcomes some of the challenges that you heard in previous slides. That is to say, people are busy doing things with, you know, living off the land, using existing tools, using existing ports. So this helps you connect the connect the dots. And so in the demo that we're going to see, we're going to take advantage of this framework. Um, let me show you uh, my browser so that you can see what I mean by the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So this is the website, attack.mitre.com. Um, and if you go here, if you're not already familiar with this, this is that encyclopedia. Um, you see a bunch of tactics spread out here at the top. Uh, and then under each tactic, there are a bunch of techniques. And so you can study this this uh, enterprise or this, this matrix in order to understand what is it that attackers are doing. But um, let's take a look at, at this in, in real life. So here I am logging into an instance of Event Tracker where I am a security analyst. And as part of my shift, I'm going to go into my incidents dashboard and since I'm working on behalf of a company called FirmTech, I'm going to focus my energy on FirmTech. And I'm looking for the last one day to see if there have been any activities, any incidents that the solution is saying that are, that are possibly of interest to me, the attacker. Right? And what I see right away is that there is an unknown MD5 hash. And when I look at it uh, and expand it, what I see is that this appears to be something called 1CP59 running in the account called Kelly. Uh, this is kind of odd. Uh, now, when I look further, what I see is that this is a signed um, executable, and it purports to be somebody called Awesome Tools. I, I may or may not know much about Kelly, and so I may or may not decide that this is a problem. So if I were to head back to my collection of, of uh, hackle-raising things, I see also that a non-browser application has connected. Now, this is always a concern for us. I get that browsers connect on port 443 on port 80, but when non-browsers do that, that's a problem. So what do I see here? Well, what I see here is that PowerShell.exe, um, under the Kelly username, has gone off and reached something called TD Alpaca Farm. Hmm. Why would PowerShell be doing this? Now, PowerShell does, in fact, do this all day long, but what's TD Alpaca Farm? That definitely doesn't seem right either. And then last but not the least, when I look at what PowerShell did, I see that it's running suspicious commands. Well, what command might it be? Well, it's an encoded command. You see this starting with an S, B, U. What that's doing is PowerShell is running, but it won't tell you what the command is that it's doing. That's because this is encoded in Base64. You can, of course, decode this if you're smart enough. So here we are with the S, B, U, blah, blah, and I could decode this. And what do you see? Well, you see that this is actually a web request going to TD Alpaca Farm. And that it's going to put the outcome in C users Kelly local temp. So that's what that suspicious command was about, right? There was one more, if I recall, right? Here it is. That happened at 6.02. Um, and so there's another encoded command. So these are all enough for me to have my, as an analyst, hackles raised. And I'm now worrying that maybe I have been affected, firm tech's been affected. Well, as I mentioned to you, Event Tracker supports the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And here is our dashboard showing all of the techniques that were known to MITRE 
but maybe have occurred in my environment over the last one day. I'm going to focus down. This is a multi-tenant console, so I have support for a variety of customers here. But I'm going to narrow the focus down to only firm tech. And I'm thinking about it over the last one day because that's my area. And I see that there are four endpoints, including a couple of workstations and a couple of, of servers. On the timeline, I see that this all seems to have begun at about 6.05 a.m. And I see a number of techniques highlighted by the MITRE ATT&CK framework occurring on this workstation 5 and continuing on until maybe about 6.20, 6.22. Right. After that, the action appears to have shifted from that workstation five over to ADC one. This is a domain controller. And I'm now seeing other kinds of suspicious activity. Now realize we've made this extremely simple in order to be able to explain this in a demo. When this happens in real life, the clues are not quite so obvious. Um, after all, this is a demo. It's shifted now to workstation eight. And ultimately by 645, Bits jobs are running. So you notice that this went from about 6.05 till maybe about 6.50 was this particular pattern. So it isn't like you had three seconds to react. You know, you had a good 45 minutes to do something about this. If you go further, and this is that matrix that you were seeing on the website, and if I were to narrow this down only to the items of interest, and this color code here tells me how often they've occurred. So really the most often has been command line. The command line's been used, and if I were to try and understand what's been done, so view the technique. This is what the encyclopedia says the command line interface technique is all about, right? It's a command line interface. It's under the execution uh, tactic, and it, it's used by these threat actors, all right? Very nice. Thank you. But what specifically happened? So if I were to log search, why then I can see what is it that happened in my particular network. And here we have it. So first of all, this technique appears to have been spawned by three different EXEs. One is that 1CP59 that we saw in the command, but also 567.exe. Now, these are oddly named. Typically, you, you get a, a proper name for it. But remember, this was signed by Awesome Tools, so that didn't raise hackles in the beginning. What sorts of commands did it do? Well, when you look at that, then there's more reason to be to be concerned. What you see is a variety of commands have been done. Oh, stop. See this? You can see a who am I. You can see some registry ads. You can see something getting mirrored to a temp log, right? Ultimately, this thing does registry changes. It does a cert util to find something. It does ARP to scope around the network. You're looking at IP config, net user patch, and finally a VSS admin delete, right? I mean, yeah, I'm making this blindly obvious, but this is what typically happens in this kind of environment. What sorts of users have been affected? Well, one is Kelly, and the other is apparently something called the R patch service. You know, here's what really went. So let's take a look at uh, and, and oh, by the way, which uh, computers were affected? Um, you saw that. I mean, it was the workstation five, workstation eight, and then the domain controllers one and 58, right? Let's take a look at one of these to try and understand what happened. So I see that Kelly's been doing something. So let me flip over to the Kelly username and see what is it that has happened under Kelly. So this thing all begins at 601, and you can see that WinWord has been launched. Now, because I don't have O365 accounts in this collection, you can see that she actually received an email. Now, in this particular instance, Kelly happens to be a person working in HR, and she's received a resume for one of the jobs that's posted, but that resume is loaded with a macro, which is bad. Now, her job requires her to open these attachments, because that's how people are submitting. And the attacker has, has done his homework to try and hope that somebody like that will actually open the attachment. And she's unfortunately done that. And when she's done that, you've got this PowerShell. This is that encoded PowerShell that you saw. And immediately what's happened is, you remember that? This is from that other, um, that other window, this decode. It has downloaded this file. 
right? So having done that now, the Kelly user is going to get compromised. What happens next? A new process runs, this 1CP59, purporting to be from Awesome Tools. Now, remember I said to you, Event Tracker has an EDR solution built in. Well, what did our EDR solution say? Well, our EDR solution found that, hey, you've got an EXE running, never seen it before, first time seen. It appears to be signed, but it's doing things that aren't quite kosher, right? When it's first time seen, even if it's signed, that's a problem. So here, for example, seven hours ago was 1CP59, apparently signed by Awesome Tools, now running on two or three different machines, right? Is this something that my antivirus should have stopped maybe if it was malware? Well, let's take a look. Here's virus total. So when we run out of virus total with that particular hash, what we see is, yeah, sure enough, many antiviruses do recognize this as a bad boy. In fact, 56 out of 70, and they kill it, prevent it from running. Well, the bad news is we happen to be running 10 micro. I'm not picking on Trend Micro, you understand. If I did this demo for you five times, I'd pick somebody else. The reality is not every antivirus catches everything. So in this particular case, if you are running Trend Micro, this thing's going to get by. And so then administrators who say, oh, but I, but I was diligent. Yeah, you were diligent. The bad guy didn't know. If you had had one of the others, this would have failed. And it's okay. He expects to fail nine out of ten times. He expects to succeed only one out of 10 times. And then out of the one out of 10 times, only one of those out of five maybe pays. That's his business model. So sure, our EDR would have caught it. And then if you go back to what else happened, and this is classic for ransomware, you'll find, for example, the very next thing that it does is it defeats VBA warnings. You know that warning you get that says, enable macro, are you sure, yes, no? Well, he's defeated that in registry. So that from now on, so the bad news can be that this gal, Kelly, having seen this resume, if it looks legit, might actually send it inside to the hiring manager saying, yeah, you look for a position, I've got a resume, is this person a candidate? Well, this Word document now will not pop up that warning anymore, just in case that hiring manager somehow was smarter or was more threat aware, where well, he's gone and defeated that, right? If you go up the chain, you'll find that um, he's performing a net view, right? And he is sending all of this to, uh, uh, to, a, to a temp log. Somewhere along the line, he also does another PowerShell, right? 1CP59 launches another PowerShell. And if you look at the PowerShell encoding, again, it's base64, and you have this thing, this particular string. Why are they doing this? Well, they're doing this in case you have some sort of thing that looks at PowerShell output. Well, by encoding it, you can't tell what he's done. So here you have that SBU. And when you decode this, what you see is it's doing an invoke web request and it's getting PS exec. You know about PS exec? This is a legitimate tool supplied by Microsoft. This internal is a Microsoft website. And it's meant to do remote execution of, of commands from one, one machine to another. And so it's because it's a legitimate antivirus endpoint protection typically doesn't stop it. So this is what that has happened under the auspices of the, of the Kelly user. So these are the dance steps. The example I showed you happened to be called Ryuk and the dance steps were from something called TrickBot. You get that obfuscated PowerShell, you know, it executes on the compromised host, it defeats uh, logging scripts. It looks around the network, you know, what else is available to me? And then it tries to grab a password and then run around using remote desktop protocol, creates a service account, downloads PowerShell Empire like you saw for PS exec, and then has its way around the network. At this point, it will begin encrypting. Nothing will be exfiltrated in this particular example, but a ransom note will pop up. Once it finds itself on a machine like a file server, it'll go to work. In some of the examples we've seen, the infestation has happened on the mailroom PC as a, for example, right? And then it spread to the domain controller, spread to the file server. I mean, imagine you're a law firm. Imagine you're an accounting firm and all of your documents now are encrypted. Is that worth $40,000 to you? Is that going to put you out of business for maybe a week or three? 
or your or your healthcare in the midst of this covid-19 some of them have been nasty enough to go pursue healthcare organizations it's just the way it is remember don corleone it's just business so that's how they've they've done it and so now that you understand how this actually works let's take a look at what is it that you can do to stop it so that was the the mitre technique and the demo and you'll find that there are some commonalities there's a dropper in this case it was trickbot there is the initial infection and that was what you saw with the windward and the 1cp59 and then there was the lateral spread you know get get around using bits get around using the r patch service and then exploit right exploit using powershell uh, and communicating with those external servers so there are some shared outcomes you know again and again you get infected or you get infected all over the enterprise um sometimes the the infection and happened in the city of baltimore because there are specialist actors somebody infiltrates and then sells uh, access to somebody else or rents access to somebody else they try ryuk give up after 30 days and access gets if you hadn't been caught access gets auctioned again right definitely infection can spread beyond what you can detect this is one of the reasons why the fbi says to you don't pay because you get tagged as a mark and you're never sure whether another infection hasn't actually still still remained there you may not have a choice but if you do don't do it and of course word gets around you are the one that will in fact pay so now that you understood how it's happening what can you do in order to pr protect yourself well some of it frankly just like with covid-19 is quite basic you know you got to wash your hands you got to make sure you wear a mask you you got to make sure that if you're sick you stay home don't come to the office and give it to everybody else so there are some system hygiene things that don't cost you any money right you could for example be religious about updating or patching software these guys are absolutely anxious to find something that's unpatched do you have on premise exchange do you have sharepoint do you have uh something from uh any of the uh, the web content companies and they tend to be infect or, or vulnerabilities that for which they're releasing patches but are you patching happens less commonly in in small and medium sized business second of course is you could avoid paying and restore from backup well that brings you the question do you have reliable backup is it off network such that it isn't getting remember you saw the way he was deleting the shadow copies in the vs he's trying to delete your backups Well if you had your backup in the same place as the machine that's not going to do you much good it needs to be offsite and oh by the way i know you implemented it did you test it did you actually go through a process of recovering it and testing that's needed otherwise it's again doesn't cost you a whole lot of money but it takes effort on your part um yet another technique is why are you still hanging on to the old antivirus it's time has come it's time has gone there's all sorts of fancy edr available including one from event tracker Don't you want to use those kinds of things? You get better protection if you do. Um, and again, nine out of ten of these attacks fail. You don't want to be that one because it really is expensive. So then you come to people and process, right? Are you phishing your users? You should be. Are you sending them bogus emails and seeing who the problem child is that that doesn't follow your instructions? Are you training them appropriately? You know that security is everybody's problem, right? the company cannot stick this on top of it and one guy in it and say that's your problem it's everybody's problem because the user could be clicking and the user is anybody right yet another thing that you should think about from a process perspective is this is not a question of if it's going to happen to you it's going to happen to you do you have a plan are you ready like the fire alarm how are you drilling it do you know if this happens who's going to react and how you're going to react or are you going to be caught with your pants down and at that point it's something that you really have to run around so this is something that you can do up front knowing that it's coming at some point and then the one that we like the most if you've done all of those things you've got to be vigilant you have to monitor activity uh, you have to use intelligence you have to be aware of what's going on what are the patterns what are the techniques and you have to be able to watch to see if any of those are occurring now this is incredibly hard to do yourself because it requires a specialist it, this is a full time job by itself it's got to be done 24/7 it's got to be done on every endpoint everywhere in your network so this can be quite difficult to do however it is supremely effective 
That, of course, is something that Event Tracker offers as a service. And so if that's of interest to you, please get in touch. So we have some more resources uh, for you if you were interested in this topic. Uh, one, how does SOC as a service block ransomware? And since David will be sending out all of these, uh, this, this recording to you, along with the slides, um, you're, you, will, you will have access at leisure. You don't have to rush to copy these. But you could just simply get on our website, netsurian.com, and look for the word ransomware, and you'll find these articles. One is how does SOC as a service block ransomware? Another is um, how MSSPs should be detecting ransomware, but using our solution called, called uh, Event Tracker. And last but not the least, if you are specifically in retail, there's a risk assessment that maybe might be interesting for you to take, um, uh, which might tell you what are the risks that you will in fact get affected. All right, so then, uh, David, are we going to do uh, another poll for this, or is this just an informational slide? This is just informational enough. Okay. So if you're interested in greater detail than what I've been able to show you, I mean, I showed you like a five or a 10-minute demo, and you want to understand how exactly this service works, what we call a deep dive. There are demos coming up. They happen pretty regularly. The next one is on the 20th, and there's the one on June 3rd. Please feel free to register, and uh, one of our analysts will walk you through the gory details if 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 you want to get your geek on. Um, want to know where to do it? Well, netsurian.com slash webcast is where you'd get it. So with that said, uh, we have time for question and answer, and I am going to throw the floor open. David reminded you of the housekeeping, but maybe you can remind us again, David, how do we ask a question? Certainly. Um, there is a questions box on the uh, toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to enter them there. We have had a couple come in. So while Ananth is uh, answering these, uh, you can enter some more, and we'll get to those in just a little bit. Um, just to circle back on what Anand said earlier, I will have links to those extra resources as well as links to uh, register for those demos in the follow-up email um, that also includes the recording. So you can uh, one-stop shop email coming your way uh, within the next couple of days. So let's get started with this first question, Anand. How long are you seeing a typical ransomware attack take? From the initial breach to boom is the question. Boom is is that's when the dynamite goes, right? Um, stuff gets encrypted. We we have tended to see two different patterns. One is it takes a day to a day and a half. Um, the initial breach is something that happens if this is through email. It may sit in the person's email box for a day or three, and the breach begins when they actually double-click the attachment if it gets past your endpoint protection. That's the point of breach. From this point forward, in order to camouflage their activities, they may take a day, a day and a half. Favorite tactic, um, do this on a Friday. Especially do it on a Friday afternoon. Why that? Well, because if they can get you to double click on a Friday afternoon around three, and then they lay low, they know you're gonna probably go home. And then the following day, Saturday, there's probably less activity, less scrutiny. And so they get all day Saturday to do that thing. So we've seen where breaches have occurred on, uh, or the, the initial breach has occurred on a Friday afternoon. And the boom has occurred on Saturday night around nine-ish. At this point, you know, IT really doesn't want to be on call, doesn't really want to have to deal with it. You know, if they've gone and encrypted the file server, is it possible that no one will notice still maybe someone really working on Saturday night? Well, if it's an accounting firm in the middle of tax season or it's a law firm that, that is, uh, you know, having a case come up, well, you bet your booty someone will. And so then, you know, all hell breaks loose at 9 p.m. on a Saturday. Uh, and that is hard to deal with. So how long from breach to boom? We've seen it take as long as a day and a half. There have been other cases where they've been very patient. And this is not automated, but human driven where they have sat and bided their time. City of Baltimore, the example I cite, and by the way, I cite that because this information is public. I'm not telling you any secrets here. Um, it took them almost a week because they had planted uh, a, a password cracker uh, by the name of Mimi Cats, and it took a week before the domain admin happened to log on to that machine. 
And so then they could reverse his hash and so on. I mean, not everyone, not every admin logging into every server every day, you know. So they sat and waited patiently for a week before they snagged his password. Now, having snagged his password, they had the run of the network for close on three months. And in that three months, there was no boom. They were presumably exfiltrating files, looking for social security numbers, looking for PII, looking to see how they could monetize this. So breach to boom, three and a half months in that case. In the meantime, what sort of theft had occurred? Difficult to know. So that's the answer to your question, David. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, someone uh, someone typed in here that they they're seeing the average dwell time. Ah, excuse me, average dwell time uh, now being at seventy eight days. So that's yes. To fit so right so there. dwell time, right? So dwell time is from uh, from the fact that you got breached to detection, mm -hmm. right? So how long did it take before you could figure out that you had been taken? So seventy eight days is consistent with what, for example, Syria. By the way, that's come down over the years, right? It used to take nine months. If you go back to the Verizon uh, data breach studies from a few years ago, it was taking close on nine months before you could even figure out that you'd been taken. That's come down steadily and is now, as as uh, as was pointed out, closer to set. But that's a long time for an attacker to have free run of your network. Mark followed up with, um, can you share how often or if you're seeing double extortion? Yeah, so how often? Um, well, sadly, it's uh, more common than we'd like to think. You see, the and, and there are a couple of reasons for it. Um, one is an entity that has been attacked successfully is quite likely to have had uh, vulnerabilities. And the question on the table is whether they have successfully taken care of all of their vulnerabilities, yes or no. And the answer is that's an ongoing fight. And the answer is usually no. Will the same guy come back or will it be another guy? Well, we find that often it's a new threat actor. In other words, um, there are a bunch of bad guys that pass your front door and every one of them that passes by examines your front door to see if there are any weaknesses. And if, if it turns out that there is a gap in the panel in the top on the left, it's not that the one guy that abused it is the only guy that noticed it. The next bad guy who comes down the street and examines your door quite likely will find the same vulnerability. And if you patch it and there happens to be another vulnerability somewhere else, they will try and exploit that. That's one reason why the repeat extortion occurs. Not necessarily the same guy, but multiple guys. Another reason why the repeat extortion occurs is, as I mentioned, these are specialist gigs, right? So what happens is there's a guy who specializes in penetration and having penetrated, he then rents access to somebody. So if he's rent and it happened in the city of Baltimore, the original penet or so we think, the original penetration happened by one actor and then there was an auction in the dark web. I have access to the city of Baltimore. Who wants to pay me? I'll give you 30 days of access. Here it is. 30 days go by. Whoever it is that rented it, it now can't get access anymore. But if that access is still open, he will rent it again. So now some other actor can bid for it and get access. So that's repeat extortion or repeat infection. Right? The, 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 the person that specializes in, in toeholds does that and tries to maintain his or her toehold as long as we can. So we do see, sadly, for those reasons, uh, repeat. Okay, Mark uh, Mark followed up with, to just to clarify that, um, say you have been compromised, however, you had a decent backup offsite and decided not to pay the ransom, then you learn they X-filed the data and blackmailed to release the data. If you're seeing Yeah, that like happened, that. yes, yes. That happened just day before yesterday, right? A pharmacy, it's in the news, you can see it in SC Magazine, Execu Farm, got hammered that way. They refused to pay because they found some other way around it. And then the bad guy said, okay, in that case, I mean, we've seen this in in uh, in, in another way. Um, you, you remember your mafia movies, right? The bad guy comes around, smacks a wrench in his hand, and he says, nice business you have here. It would be a shame if it burned down. And he's extorting you to pay protection. Right mm -hmm. now, you pay the guy. Does it mean he's not going to burn you down? Does it mean that there's not another guy that shows up? 
does it mean that he's not going to show up again next month no it doesn't mean any of those things so then with that an idea in mind what is your recommendation about paying ransom these days i like the fbi says try your best not to do it okay um why should you not do it well a there's no guarantee that you're going to get anything that works in at least 10% of the cases, because the guy that's writing the ransomware has written buggy ransomware, um, the decryption tool that he gives you doesn't work. You paid for it, he honestly, quote, if there is any honesty among such crooks, he honestly gives you the decryptor. Turns out that there's a bug and the decryptor somehow doesn't work. In about 10% of the cases, even though you paid, even though the guy wanted to give you the decryptor because of bugs in the software, it doesn't work. In some of the other cases, you're going to pay, you're going to get it back, no guarantee against future infection. If you can bite the bullet, if you can manage to right your ship, do that. It will be painful, it will be difficult, but you'll be better off than paying ransom. That's the reason the FBI says it. Now, practical stuff happens. Believe it or not, we've seen some uh, defense companies that get hired you know, in order to find, you're a, you're a small business, you don't know what this stuff is, you hire somebody, that somebody supposedly is gonna save you from ransomware, they claim to have secret sauce, um, they collect consulting fee from you, and there have been cases where that consulting fee is used to actually pay the ransom. So the ransom is 50 grand, the guy comes around and says 60 grand and I'll solve your problem. You pay him 60 grand, he pays 50 grand to get the key, pockets 10 grand, gives you the key, says, look, I solved your problem for you and goes on. So you hired a crook. You could have paid 50 grand if you're gonna do that, but you, you're you just not familiar. You don't know where to go, how to pay, et cetera. So you hired somebody thinking that they know how to decrypt, no? Crooks too. So this has occurred in the past. So unbeknownst to you, the company that you hired might wind up paying ransom on your behalf. Should you do it? You need to be careful about that sort of thing. Okay. Great, great insight. Um, I've got one more. There is a, uh, this is a little away from that a little bit, but um, why are SLED slash GOVT becoming a focus for ransomware attacks? Yeah, so state, local, and education is what SLED stands for. GOVT, of course, is government. Um, there's several reasons, right? They tend to be less well defended, same as the SMB. Um, very often they aren't staffed by full time, but instead by contract employees. It's the same reason that Edmund Hillary said he climbed Everest, right? Because it's there. Um, and so if they can be easy targets uh, and the attacker really doesn't care what sort of havoc he raises and there's a, there's a chance that they will pay it, Several cities in Florida before this horrible coronavirus happened uh, had been extorted. You know, at least in one example, uh, they ransomed, uh, they encrypted um, all the bits, bits of evidence from, from the various tickets and, you know, speeding fines and the red light jumping and the so on. The video server that had all that evidence got encrypted. So the city was faced with the prospect that I can collect X dollars if I get that back through fines and whatnot, which is revenue to my kitty, or I can lose all of it. In order to get that X dollars, should I pay 0.5X to the, to the attacker? If I do, then I at least get some revenue, right? So it's the economy, stupid, as, uh, as they told Mr. Clinton. All right. It, it usually is the economy and not that. I understand that completely. Well, that uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, if there are some questions, and there were a couple that we didn't get a chance to get to, we'll try and reach out to you uh, within the next couple of days and get those answered. Thanks again to everybody for joining us. Thank you so much to Ananth for all your time and insight that you provided today. We really appreciate that. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I'll you be on the lookout for that follow-up email with the recording and all those links and your chance to uh, register for a demo. Thanks again, Anath. Really appreciate it. Thank you all.